so I'm starting recording. And now let me share my screen. Okay, can you guys see that nicely? Thank you. Let us begin then. Information theory and language, or I think perhaps we put human language in the title. Um, so the main, uh, the main core of what we're gonna get out of information theory today is consideration of communication and how information is transmitted between a sender and a receiver. Uh, uh, a way of looking at that information in terms of a range of possible messages and the uncertainty on the part of the receiver as to what the message is gonna be. And basically out of these core notions, we're gonna develop various kinds of mathematical formulations and we're going to find many ways in which this seems to be uh, a shaping force in actual human language. And just to give you a taste of one of these very core formulations, if we imagine those three possible messages, yes, no, or later, and uh, using shading here, I'm indicating different degrees of probability for those messages. So we see here in the top row, I'm imagining where the message being yes is very strongly expected and probable. And then we can imagine another situation where yes is still the most likely, but no and later are also a bit more likely. And then finally, we can imagine a situation where you really don't know what they're gonna say. They might say yes, no, or later. They're all got the same probability. And information theory is gonna give us a formula for uh, quantifying that amount of uncertainty from a message source. So yeah, there's, there's gonna be some information coming through and it's gonna tell us how uncertain we are of that. And the cool thing is that quantification of information ties in with uh, theories about how long the messages are gonna be and ways of optimizing the coding system for those messages. So before I start, rambling on more about this, I'd actually like to hear from anyone here about what does information theory mean to you? Do you have an idea of what it means? Um, it can be a very vague or incorrect idea. Um, maybe it means nothing to you. Anyone got something to share? Um, it, it makes me think of uh, like computer networks and um, you've got to send a certain amount of bits down a cable and if, if a certain percentage of them get garbled, can you still recover the signal and that kind of uncertainty and stuff? Yep. Yes, that's, that's a pretty good for, uh, concept of it. And humans kind of do the same as well. Um, Charles is Charles is here with us now. Well, I'm really I'm quite glad to see uh, people saying that they have no particular idea what it means. That's great. Um, that's the that's our starting assumption for this masterclass. So you're in the right place um, to just give you a little bit more of a taster. So information theory um, proposes communication as a transfer of a range of possible meanings. And those messages are reducing the uncertainty about what is meant. Or you can also think about it as a state of affairs in the world, what, what is going on in the world. And maybe the receiver has less uh, knowledge or information about that. And maybe the sender knows more about it. And then there's a reduction in that uncertainty. And as I've mentioned, coding systems, which can transfer this information more or less efficiently. <clears throat> 
Why should you care about this? Well, as we're going to uh, demonstrate, these concepts of predictability and uncertainty seem to have a fundamental role in shaping human language. It turns up in interesting ways again and again in different results in linguistics. And what I really like about it is the way that uh, this approach cuts across the subfields of linguistics. So it turns out to be applicable in semantics, phonology, morphology, syntax, pragmatics. So I like the way that it shows some common currents and kind of uh, common concepts that you can use where much of the time in linguistics, we end up treating these different subfields as very separate. I also really like that uh, information theoretic approach ties into cognitive science and various concepts about how the human mind might work. And finally, I just want to say it's actually pretty easy to use and to apply. So it involves maths, but the maths is pretty simple. And even a person like me could learn to use it. So here's the rundown for today's masterclass. It's breaking down into four segments, each of this. Okay. Can we get muting on uh, everyone else? Oh, the next bit is just walking. Can someone, okay. does anyone else have the power to mute or am I the only one who has the power to mute? Okay, I got that one. Perhaps before I go on, I might, I think am I the only host at the moment? I might need to make someone else. I'll make Charles a co-host so that he will also be able to deal with those kind of things, which always happen. Um, now, as I was just saying, uh, so today's masterclass breaks into four parts, each about 45 minutes, and we'll be tag teaming, alternating between me and Charles. First, background and fundamentals, then semantic typology, then we'll have about a half hour break. Um, I may also hang around a bit in the break if people want to chat or ask questions. Then I will talk about phonology, morphology, and syntax. And then finally, Charles will talk about the mysterious and powerful principle of uniform information density. Now, as we go along, we invite you to jump in whenever, ask questions, uh, make comments. We'd like this to be as much a discussion as, as any of you guys would like it to be. So for that, you can use the hand raise function or you can pop something in the chat. And between me and Charles here, we'll be able to keep an eye on what's going on in the chat. Um, for me personally, I wouldn't actually mind if someone even just wants to turn on their microphone and jump in with a comment. That's probably okay with me as well. Okay, so let's jump a bit more into this. And Firstly, uh, who are we to be talking about this? So my name is John Mansfield. I'm a lecturer in linguistics at the University of Melbourne. Um, I guess my main areas in linguistics are language change, I should have put there, and uh, morphology and phonology. I have a particular personal interest in what are the basic units of language and what are principled ways in which we can define them and identify them. And I just want to highlight that I'm not a mathematician at all. I have absolutely zero maths background, not even to the end of high school. Charles Kemp, who you'll be seeing much more of very soon, is uh, by contrast a professor in psychology. He has expertise in topics such as categorization across cultures and efficient communication. And Charles would like to point out that he is not a linguist. Uh, however, I don't fully accept that partly because what is a linguist anyway, really? So let's get into this background and fundamentals. Um, I'm gonna set you a bit of the scene of how information theory arose. And I'm gonna draw somewhat here on a book I've been reading recently called The Information by James Gleick, a pop science writer. Uh, parts of this are a really good read and give a really nice uh, picture of how information theory came about. So we need to imagine the setting in the early to mid 20th century in which there were great advances in mathematical logic, formal logic, and at the same time there was uh, advances and a growing practical need for cryptography, for people to uh, learn new cutting edge techniques for encoding information and decoding information. 
And there was also a gradually rising uh, phenomenon of people counting words and symbols and looking at the statistical patterns in words and symbols. Um, so on the technology side, we had a series of new inventions coming out, which enabled uh, people to transfer information over distances. Uh, a very important one is the telegraph. We see here the telegraph encoding key, which people use to tap little bleeps of electricity through a wire. And we see here some of the coding uh, conventions for the telegraph. And early in the 20th century, there was uh, some very uh, innovative work from George Zipf. Like I mentioned, uh, this the rise of counting letters and symbols and words. And so George Zipf started to uncover some very powerful principles in human language, such as this, this very intuitive idea of a relationship between the length of words and how frequently they're used. So as we can see in this graph, where on the y-axis, we have how frequently a word is used. So we have the there is like the most frequent word in English. And then on the x-axis, we have how long that word is with administration and information being rather long words. So of course, we see this relationship where the, the frequent ones are short and the infrequent words tend to be longer. And this appears to be a very intuitive principle of efficiency and economization of effort in human language. Uh, obviously, you, you can just intuitively see how you're going to communicate more efficiently by making the common things nice and brief. However, you can't just go rampant with uh, maximal economy and making everything as short as possible because you also need to distinguish a range of possible messages and you need to uh, limit the amount of misunderstanding from your receiver, right? So you can't just make everything maximally short because you need certain length of message just to help distinguish the different messages. And this then involves a trade-off between two fundamental principles of communication and Charles is going to tell you a lot more about that trade-off in his part. So zooming in a bit more on the context, I want to take you in particular to the 1940s and Bell Labs, uh, which was in New York City at the time, I think. And Bell Labs was this incredibly uh, influential scientific institution in which they uh, made all sorts of discoveries but uh, including, I think it grew out of telephone technology and Alexander Graham Bell. But one thing in particular they're working on at this time was cryptography because of the Second World War, of course, uh, this, these cryptographic methods uh, became incredibly important in the fortunes of nations. Um, but I want to highlight that alongside the practical problems of cryptography, some of the key people working on it were also very interested in larger theoretical questions about how, uh, how machines can treat information and messages. So of course, Alan Turing is very famous in, in this role. And he was there at Bell Labs in the 1940s. And he was in the road role of a code breaker. So decrypting codes. And then working there at the same time, you had a slightly perhaps less famous man called Claude Shannon, who was a code maker he was tasked with encrypting messages. And both of them in their own ways were very interested in how, how do you make a message anyway? How do you even express information formally, mathematically, computationally? And we know that they actually chatted sometimes in the lunchrooms at Bell Labs. We don't really know what they chatted about, but we can guess that they didn't talk about what they were working on because they wouldn't have been allowed to legally. Um, so here's Claude Shannon, who is generally regarded as the founding father of information theory. As, as we see here, he has this uh, very penetrating gaze and this kind of, I call it a handsome vampire look. He's quite an interesting guy. And he didn't just uh, invent information theory. And of course, it wasn't just him who invented information theory, but he's kind of identified as the guy. Um, he also did stuff like he worked on developing a computer that could play chess 
which I think must have seemed like a very fanciful left field idea in 1949. But you know, that, that seemed to work out in the end. So I think Claude Shannon uh, was actually a very forward thinking, a um, bit of a futuristic seer kind of guy. Uh, and most importantly, he worked on developing a flaming trumpet, which was, of course, not perfectly seeing the future because it turned out that flaming trombones are actually a far more powerful invention. Another thing he did at this time, while working on his, uh, so while he's working on his um, cryptography and uh, that tying into computer systems for communication, he was also getting into looking at um, statistical patterns in natural language. He did stuff like looking at um, probabilistic English letter sequences and coming up with stuff like, uh, so if you just looked at uh, a, a corpus, a set of language data from English and thought, well, what happens if I just look at which for any given letter in English, what's the most likely next letter? And then I can create an algorithm, like a little message encoder that just always spits out the next most probable letter. And it comes out with stuff like this, which of course is garble, but interestingly, it kind of looks a bit like English. So that, that fact that it starts to look a bit like language, even just based on that very simplistic uh, probabilistic principle seems to maybe tell us something. But he also, as well as looking at probabilistic letter sequences, started to look at probabilistic word sequences. So when he looked at just for any given word in a data set, what's the, pro what's the next, what's the most probable following word, he came up with stuff like this, which again is garble, but is starting to look less garbly and more and more like, actually, this is getting pretty similar to, to English. I would read this. So Shannon's ideas um, did turn out to be very uh, prescient, right? Because that that's, may have seemed like a pretty wacky idea, just looking at what's the next most probable word. But of course, now, 70 years later, we all walk around holding basically that idea in our hands all the time. And I don't know what you guys think, but I feel like predictive text has actually started to get pretty good in the last few years. I'm quite impressed with it. Um, it, of course, doesn't always work perfectly. Uh, the Android predictive text algorithm around 2018 started to have a slight issue in what it predicts next for sit on. And this actually points in an interesting way to some issues with predictive text because, of course, it's not, uh, it doesn't involve a lot of human intervention, from what I understand. It's just like slurping in loads and loads of input text from the internet, of course. And what do people talk about on the internet? Well, they spend a lot of their time just talking about sitting on each other's faces. So that's what you get in your um, language model. Um, but we see here on the right, uh, rather than just a simple kind of text predictor, we see here on the right, a much more sophisticated AI language model. Although again, it's just based on protest, uh, so processing statistical patterns in loads and loads of text. But these models, which are in some ways just a kind of more distant evolution of Shannon's ideas, are increasingly getting good at acting like a human, at acting like they can use language, which of course is the classic Turing test that Alan Turing proposed, where you can test for intelligence or something in a machine by asking it questions in language and seeing if it can reply to those questions. And so this recent version, this is kind of a mashup of a uh, recent AI algorithm with kind of Chomskyan approach to linguistics where you take out the semantic meaningfulness and just have grammatical structures. And we can see here that the AI can do pretty good work with just the grammatical structure without, without necessarily having meanings and of course, there are three bonks in a quote. That seems like a good answer to me. Now, I don't know, should I keep an idea on the chat, right? There's uh, a question in the chat from Alison about whether the probabilistic letter sequences work is a statistical extension of phonology. Yes. Yes, I, I think that's, that is an excellent way of looking at it. And in fact, you're, you're anticipating there in the third section 
when I talk about uh, phonology, morphology, and syntax, I will talk a bit more about this, how the statistical approach ties in with um, even basic theories of basic theoretical foundations of phonology. So, meanwhile, in linguistics, while all these technological and information theoretic developments were happening, in linguistics, what was going on? Well, as Alison uh, just very insightfully pointed out, um, some of the phonology that was happening in the early to mid 20th century was actually quite allied to information theory. People like Trubetskoy and Jakobsen were very interested in the statistical distribution of the sounds in language. Um, this was a period, the 40s and 50s, where structuralism in linguistics was, uh, was dominant. Um, I won't try and say too much about what structuralism is. Perhaps I don't really understand it yet myself. Apart from that, they were very interested in distributional patterns in language. There was a kind of empiricist bent where you could try and find procedures just to look at just to look at text and try and uh, find a procedure for, for discovering the elements of it. So people like Charles Hockett and Zelig Harris, who were the, the, some of the dominant structuralists at the time, they were very interested in these things like transition probabilities. But we then had in the later 1950s, of course, the arrival of Noam Chomsky, uh, working then at Massachusetts Institute's Institute of Technology, and Noam Chomsky was interested in uh, formal logic and uh, in computational logic, but took this strongly mentalist approach to human language where the key to it, if I can just boil it down very simplistically, was uh, finding out what's going on in people's heads and not getting too tied up with uh, with empirical facts about the human behavior, right? So obviously you had this famously Chomsky was rejecting behaviorist approaches where you just kind of look at the data and getting more into um, introspection and uh, just looking directly at our mental structures. As part of that, from all I can tell, he seemed really not interested in, well, so I say refuted linear transitions because he also famously showed that a Turing machine, which just uh, a finite state, finite state transducer that just looks at things in terms of states and sequences is not a very good model for human language, which is instead much more kind of hierarchical and recursive. And he seems to have been generally not very impressed with statistical distributions. Now, why I'm saying all that is because I think that setting tells us a lot about why information theory was not particularly prevalent in linguistics for the following decades. Because the Chomsky approach at MIT was wildly successful, that became kind of the mainstream in linguistics for at least for a few decades. And because it kind of was set up in a way in opposition to these more kind of statistical empirical approaches, then perhaps that kind of uh, reduced the, the prevalence of information theory at a time when it was very influential in many other fields. But gradually more probabilistic and eventually information theoretic approaches have uh, come to rise in linguistics. As we'll see, especially in the last decade or so, there is actually an enormous amount now of information theoretic work in linguistics. You can see earlier, um, threads of it coming through in areas such as, so you had phoneticians who were interested in things like, how do you discriminate a phonetic signal, which has very natural ties to, to information theory topics, uh, including what Alex Bowen was mentioning before about you know, how, does, uh, how does signal get through in, the, in a situation with noise. Um, phonology all along had this kind of, uh, natural relationship to information theory, which gradually became stronger from about 2000 onwards. And then you had more kind of syntactic work coming through such as Hale's paper in 2001. And meanwhile, you've got corpus linguistics getting stronger and stronger as more corpus data became available and works like Church and Hanks in the 1990s starting to use information theoretic principles to find patterns in corpora. 
And perhaps a kind of landmark is this book I show here, Probabilistic Linguistics from 2003, which has like a chapter for each subfield of linguistics and talking about the probabilistic approaches. Interestingly, this book barely mentions, it doesn't very often mention actual kind of explicitly information theoretic concepts, uh, but I conjecture that if the same book was published this year, it would probably use a lot more information theoretic terminology because actually they're pretty similar kind of approaches in the end. So I'm now going to dig a bit more into the content of information theory and some of the basic maths. I'll just take a little breather and sip some water, give people a chance to think of any questions. But otherwise, let's do some maths with someone who's not a mathematician which I think can work because sometimes a person who's only just learned a thing themselves can, can be good at explaining it. So we can think about uh, communication as you need to have a set of symbols. They could be spoken symbols or sign symbols. They could be written symbols. They can be electric bleeps, just any kind of symbols, right? And you're gonna need a set of distinct symbols to distinguishing different messages. So one question is, how many different symbols do you have to work with? How many different symbols does your receiver know and recognize? And how many different messages might you potentially want to communicate? And then how long are your messages going to be? And if you don't want them to be too long, obviously, or at some point it's going to be un unviable. So these are some of the different parameters we need to work with. And in the early 20th century, people start to work out how these parameters are related. So for example, I would like someone to help me solve this problem. If you have just two symbols in your inventory, so this is the most basic possible communicative system where all you have is a zero and a one, but let's say you've got 32 different messages that you might wanna communicate. So one way of thinking about it is how long will your messages need to be to communicate your 32 different messages? Can someone please figure that for me? Yes, beautiful, right? We've got correct or almost correct answers. Excellent. Okay, so someone's already worked the whole thing out. Um, I might just, Thomas, do you want to take over from here? Um, all right, so you're going to, they're going to be five symbols long, as I was pointed out. So you're going to have these different combinations of zeros and ones. And we can, with a bit of maths, we can work out that you'll need five symbols to be able to generate 32 different messages. And that's basically on a principle of, how many times uh, do you need to times by two to get to 32? So if we imagine our first symbol and it can be zero or one, and so now we can distinguish two different messages. And then we get to our second symbol and we now times by two again, because now each of those can be combined with a different zero and one. And so we're kind of doing this uh, exponential operation where we keep timesing by two with each new position. And that gives us eventually 32 after we've gone through five different symbols. And from this, so we get a formula for working out it's two raised to the five raised to the number of uh, symbols in the message that gives us the number of messages. And we can just create a generalized formula that relates the number of different symbols to the number of possible messages and the length of the code. And this can actually give us a way of thinking about an amount of information. And it can show us equivalences such as that having 32 different symbols and just one length of code is the same amount of information as having two different symbols and five positions in code. And this little mathematical formula, which I think is from Hartley 1928, uh, captures that mathematically. Um, and these are going to get this amount of information. We're going to start calling it bits, which is short for binary digits. Binary referring back to the fact that we're using this where the common currency of information is the most basic possible way of expressing it, just zeros and ones. Every possible message can be expressed in zeros and ones, but you can't, you can't get any more basic than that, right? Because you need to have at least two distinct symbols. Okay, so this, this system of at least just two distinct symbols is our common currency, and we're going to call that bits. Now, what about 
Did I skip a slide there? All right. How can we extend that formulation to think about messages that have probabilities? So what if we've got four messages and to make it simpler, to keep it uh, kind of simple, we're gonna think about four messages that all have a probability of 0.25, they'll have equal probability. Now I'm gonna do my coding where I'm gonna use codes like zero, zero and one, zero. And that gives me distinct codes for the four of them. And now, uh, let me just see if I can think this through. Basically what I find is that amount of information, which is two bits in each one of these. So each one of these messages consists of two bits. But if those messages each have a probability of 0.25, I can kind of rejig my formula so I can uh, express this amount of information in terms of the probability of the message. And to do that, I basically just need to add a negative to the log, which is something to do with the way that logs work and you can uh, flip things on their head, which I won't go through. That basically, if we make it a negative log and then use the probability of the message, then we can come up with a way of formulating the amount of information in a message based on the probability of that message. Okay, so it works kind of neatly when all the messages have the same probability and it helps if there's four or eight or 32 of them. But then we also get, of course, all kinds of other probabilities. So back to our old, is the message gonna be yes, no, or later? And they've all got the different random probabilities like maybe 0.6 and 0.1 and 0.3. And we can use that formula to express the amount of information in those possible messages. So we're kind of doing this generalization procedure, which is at the core of so much maths. So now that same uh, formula is gonna give us numbers for the amount of information and yes, which is the most uh, probable or expected message is gonna come out as having 0.74 bits of information and no is gonna have more, it's 3.32 and later is somewhere in between. So these are the amount of information, the bits of information in these messages. And we're gonna start calling that surprisal, where surprisal is formally the negative log probability of the message. And we're gonna use a binary logarithm. So logs can have different bases. That's actually important to know because sometimes you might read a paper or something where they're using a different base for the log. Sometimes these are natural logarithm. I didn't know that for ages and I just didn't know why the numbers were different. But anyway, binary logarithm we're gonna go with. Okay. And this is intuitively a way of expressing surprisal as opposed to probability. You can think of surprisal as kind of probability flipped over. So the things that are more probable are less surprising and the things that are less probable are more surprising, right? So of course, if yes was the expected message, it's gonna have low surprisal. When the person says yes, you're not, as a receiver, you're not gonna be very surprised. You'd be like, nah, they said yes, all right? But if they say no, and that was an improbable message, you're gonna be surprised. It's gonna have high surprise of like 3.32 bits. Oh no, I didn't expect them to say no. Now I have to find a different date for the prom. Um, and just to also reinforce this concept of a bit, a single bit of surprisal is because of the nature of it being a binary thing, uh, a single bit is equivalent to a 50-50 chance. If a thing had just a 50-50 probability, then the amount of surprisal would be one bit. And it could be communicated. And if you have just two possibilities and they're equally probable, then obviously you're gonna code them as just a zero and a one, okay? So they're both gonna be one bit. Markedness, right. Sorry, I didn't see at what point. Susie, do you wanna to speak to this? I didn't see at what point that came up. I can guess maybe markedness was in reference to phonology again and the rise of info theory and linguistics. Okay, I'll try and I'll try and keep a closer eye on the chat. Okay. So we've got as far as expressing the amount of information in a message using this uh, notion of bits, bits of surprise, right? Now, there's also the issue of having the range of messages, right? So we've got our three different messages with different amounts of surprise for each message. 
Uh, and when we look at the overall amount of surprisal among the range of messages, that's going to give us a way of calculating what's the expected average message length in our coding scheme. Now, this is important because you want your coding scheme to work well for every, for all the possible messages, right? You don't want your whole coding scheme to be just based on being good for one particular message. You've got to get a coding scheme that works for everything, right? You've got to find a way of optimizing among all the possible messages. And that's what this maths is going to give us. Because the surprisal, we're going to work out the weighted average surprisal for the different possible messages, right? So they have their different surprisals. Here's the most unsurprising. Here's the most surprising. And then by weighted average, what we're doing is we're timesing the surprisal of each message by the probability of that message. So it's like actually the log, the negative log probability times just the normal probability. And we're then going to give the weighted average of the different surprisals. And this has an interesting kind of balancing effect, I want to call it, where although this message no has really high surprisal, because it's low probability, that then means it's got less influence in the overall weighted average. Whereas yes, although it has lower surprisal, because it's more probable, it ends up having more influence on the overall weighted average. But anyway, once you do this maths, you then come out with a weighted average expected number of bits, which in this case would be 1.29. And that then gives us our expected average message length if we can come up with the optimal coding system. Plus we can think of that as the overall amount of information in this message source. So if we have a message producing source that comes out with these messages, with these levels of probability or surprisal, that is the overall uncertainty or surprisingness or informativity of the message source. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call entropy. This powerful enigmatic concept here is the formula for it, which is just in more fancy symbols, what I just explained in words. So H is the amount of information, X is a variable, and this is the, uh, what do you call it? The sum of the different weighted probability surprisals, right? And you'll see this in different formulations. Uh, so it's this kind of thing that I, would have found very intimidating at some point and got very confused about the fact that you see slightly different notations of it, which it turns out because of the weird probability of logarithms, these all mean exactly the same thing, but there's different ways you can flip it around, but that is entropy, right? And so entropy gives us an average binary message length in an optical encoding. It's a way of conceptualizing the informativity of a message source and then Related concepts connect to things like thermodynamic disorder or dissipation of energy. These things that they're like, whether they're the same or not, or whether they're just metaphorical connections or what is above my reading level to say. But just to let you know, there's stuff out there like grand unifying theories of the universe as just being made up of information. It's interesting to read about. Personally, I don't really understand it. And uh, we will not be covering this in today's masterclass, sadly. Okay, so just to summarize that, if we have the possible messages uh, and we're really unsure, let's say they're all kind of the same probability, then it's going to be highly informative when we find out what it is, right? Whereas if you already pretty much knew what the message is going to be, it's not very informative. There's a small amount of information going on there. If you know, if you're completely sure what the message is going to be, 100% probability, then there's no information, right? When the person says yes, you haven't learned anything, okay? So there's quite this, it turns out there's a really intuitive connection between uncertainty and information or communication. And I love the way the maths kind of builds that up piece by piece. Okay, little chat going on there. Yeah, theory of everything, right? If only. Um, that's the extra reading for, that's homework to um, understand the theory of everything by Monday. All right, so let's hear from you guys again. I mentioned about Morse code before, right? So Morse code, you've got dots and dashes, which you're tapping out on this little key. And so when they developed this telegraph, uh, 
technology. And this for a while was the dominant way of doing long distance communication. It spread quickly across uh, the, the wealthy countries. And they had to work out a convention for how to encode stuff. So how would you do this? How would you allocate keystrokes to letters in Morse code? Can someone explain? All right, got the chat box going on there. Uh, we've got a question there about entropy. Yes, so the question from Nicola is, is entropy the average amount of new information per message? I think, yes, that seems like the correct formulation to me. Or maybe expected average. Some of the, some of the exact equivalences between these mathematical concepts are not, have not complete expertise in. All right, so as for the Morse code, there's 26 letters and right, you, there's a bit of punctuation binary code with four digits all right nice okay so someone's thinking through we've got 30 odd different things we might want to express and we're going to need like four digits dots and dashes are like ones and zeros okay all right and someone else has pointed out it would make sense to use fewer dots for common sounds you're right and people are mentioning that you want the frequent letters to use fewer dots so you guys have basically just reinvented Morse code in three minutes. So that was pretty good. That was probably quicker than what it took Samuel Morse. So take that Samuel Morse. Um, and here is, here is the conventional Morse code, I think. And how you read this diagram is, so E and T, which I think are at least some of the most frequent letters, if not the most frequent letters, this means that E is a single dot, T is a single dash, then I is a dot, is a dot dot, and A is a dash dot. And so you can see again, we've got this like binary splitting thing, like I showed before, much like the maths of information quantities. So we have to keep splitting out things in this kind of exponential way. And we've done this thing, as you guys suggested, where the common letters, we're going to use fewer taps, because as we said before, it's going to end up being more efficient, right? So when you put a Q or a Z, it doesn't matter if you have to do five taps because you don't have to do it very often. So overall, these things are going to balance out to create a nice efficient coding system. And a couple more things in the chat. The Mandarin one is the same I can imagine, right? Is Morse code different in different languages? Shiva, all right, that's a, a fantastic question. I do not know the answer. Does anyone, so apparently we've got some info here. The Mandarin one is crazy. And yes, Ed says, yes, it's different. And Cyrillic, right? Okay, so yeah, it, it would be pretty fun to actually just have a look up at Morse code in different languages. If I ever get to do this course again, I might, I might get into that, that sounds cool. All right, so this other concept, um, very important inf information theory, and you guys have already flagged it, is how much information can fit through a channel. So we've been looking at a very, so our channel we've been talking about just has two possible symbols. So that's easy. But then there's a question of how many symbols can fit through per second, right? And then this is gonna fit into all the wiring and the technology. And that's why this stuff was uh, so important in the rise of computing. Um, and Charles is gonna tell you much more about this. He knows this stuff much better than me, okay? But this is important out there. And I'm going to give you a nice little fluffy example of channel capacity in information theory. And I was inspired to this through that Gleek book, but I looked at also the original research from some Africanist guy called Carrington. So Kele language, a Bantu language in, oof, I think it was, sorry, a Bantu language uh, somewhere in West Africa, I think. Um, They've got their spoken phonological form of the language, and they also have a parallel drum language, right? Now, in drum language, in Kele drum language, you might drum out the equivalent of something like toi neke lolongo loi, lolika lika lokas. All right, I won't try and read it all out. You would drum out the drum equivalent of this, and that might mean that would be a call to a neighboring village to say, come to a wrestling match. We're gonna have a wrestling match here. 
And people were using these drum languages to communicate across distances, right? The villages could be miles apart, but they could hear the drum over that distance. So it's a very nice, efficient way of getting people, getting the message, say, getting people to come visit your village. Plus, like telegraph repeater stations, the message could then be repeated from village to village and go across hundreds of kilometers, right? Now, one thing you may notice here is that message in drum language, it looks rather long for, it's just saying come to a wrestling match, right? You linguists, you must have noticed, why is there like 13 words to say come to a wrestling match? It's a bit odd. Well, it's a, in drum language, you express things in very poetic ways. Yeah, whistling language, right. Oh, another great idea for future versions of the course. You should definitely get into whistling language as well. Yeah, whistling languages where they go across the gorges and stuff. It's amazing. All right. Literally, what they're drumming out is not just come to a wrestling match. These drum languages have these very poetic, florid forms. They're actually drumming out, let us dance the dance which came from the river of the Bayana tribe. And that's a way of saying we're going to have a wrestling match. All right. So... One way of looking at drum language is you just say, all right, there's these conventionalized poetic forms people use. That's interesting, but perhaps not unusual. There's all kinds of ritualistic language going on in the world. But it turns out that there's a very important principle going on here. So let's say I'm going to drum out a message about manioc. It's a staple carbohydrate in the region. I want people to bring me some manioc or something. So if I first just want to uh, transmit the concept of manioc, and then I'm going to have to transmit other stuff about bring it here or whatever. I want to drum out manioc, right? The word is lomata. Now, in my drum language, the thing is, how do I how do I drum words? Well, the drum is called a slip drum, and basically, what I can do is I can drum a low beat and a high beat. And why that works is because like many Bantu languages, Kele is a tonal language with high and low tones on each syllable. So if I want to drum out manioc, I'll just go and hit three low tones and you'll know I want manioc, right? Except that you won't know because there's a bunch of words that have three low tones. I could also be trying to say bolemba, bad spirit, or bosongo, white man, right? There's uncertainty in the message, right? So we've got these three possible messages and there's uncertainty from the receiver's end. Another way of putting this is that the drum language has lower channel capacity than the spoken language. So in the spoken language, we can distinguish these different words because we've got all these uh, consonants and vowels which are different, but the drum language just reduces it down to a binary low high and that then raises the uncertainty due to the lower channel capacity. Now, what that means then is if I want to communicate to you uh, just, the, just the concept manioc, I'm going to have to drum out a longer conventionalized equivalent. I'm going to drum out uh, lomata otikala kondo, giving a low, 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 high, low, low, high, low which is a poetic way of saying that. So I'm now saying the manioc, which remains in the fallow ground, it's a conventionalized way of saying manioc, which the main point is that it's long and florid and redundant because now instead of having three symbols in my code, I've got like nine symbols in my code. And that's gonna help me to distinguish all the different messages I may wanna communicate. So it turns out these African drum languages are actually a lovely example of information theory in action where people are communicating using a narrow capacity channel, but they're then building in redundancy to the code to work around that. Right, and there's... Right, and, yeah, and it's in the Amazon as well, thanks Ed. Yeah, there's also these, uh, yeah, I've seen some pretty interesting stuff about Amazonian drum languages too. Um, right, so... Just to manage our expectations now before we go into the next sections. So information theory doesn't do everything. From what I can tell, it doesn't really have a theory of semantic content. So, some, so there's the actual semantic content of messages, things like, and in, in much of linguistic theory, this turns out to be important concepts like time and space. 
and agency and animacy are important in linguistics. From what I can tell, they don't really play a role in information theory because we're just looking at uh, messages as formal symbols with probabilities. Similarly, when we think about phonology and phonetics, there's no phonetic substance. There's no hand shape in uh, information theory. There's no voicing or coronal place of articulation. It's just, again, looking at it as formally discrete symbols, which however, have these interesting degrees of uncertainty. But what information theory does do is uh, spread insight on many formal properties of language, semantic distinctions and ambiguities, phonological contrasts and related phonetic variation, syncretism and paradigms, which actually I'm not gonna talk about today, uh, difference between words and phrases, I think, and even word order. So that gives you some of the taster of what's to come. Uh, I think that's it for this section. There's references for everything today are gonna be on the slides. I'll hold this on the recording for a moment so that people watching recordings can look at this part and that's all the slides for this one. Okay, so we've got one question in there. Would this mean that information theory is not good at dealing with gradable aspects of communication like prosody? And yes, I can try to distribute a PDF of the slides. Uh, what do you think, Charles? What is this? We have a question here about information theory dealing with gradable aspects, grading aspects, like say different pitch. Well, so in the next part, I'm gonna talk a bit about color categories that, and I think of them as graded sort of phenomena as well. So I think, I'm not quite sure whether it gets the aspects of prosody you have in mind, but I think graded, graded things are okay. They, they're kind of within scope for information theory. Mm. The only thing that comes to mind for me is I, I have a very vague understanding that Shannon's uh, work also involved taking, um, taking continuous signals uh, using, I don't know what, formants or pitch or wave wavelengths or something and quantizing them and therefore being able to put them into, you know, basically quantized zeros and ones. So I'm sure there's some kind of connection, but it's a bit beyond my, beyond my reading level. Okay, so that's it for me. I will hand over to, that's it for me for now. I will hand over to Charles. Thanks for listening. Um, should we maybe just give people like two minutes, Charles, just to, yeah. So please just take like two minutes to, it's probably a good idea to get up and stretch and clear your head because there's heaps of information coming through. And we'll just let Charles clear his thoughts. Very glad you guys are enjoying it so far. It's, it's, it's nice to have that feedback. It does help us know we're on track. So we'll just give people another minute in case they're grabbing a glass of water or something. And we can all just gaze at Noga and Frank's handsome faces. How's Frank going, Edinburgh? Oh, uh, well, I think. Yeah, I'm sure. He's like, he's living there now, right? Yeah, he's there permanently now. Yeah. yeah, what went wrong with the flaming trumpet? Indeed. Well, I think the trombone added some kind of like, what do you call it? Basically propulsion method. So that's that turned out to be the superior invention. All right, I think people have had a chance to get their glass of water and clear their heads. So let's go on. Okay, good morning, everybody. So in this part, I'm gonna talk a bit about information theoretic trade-offs and semantic typology. And I wanted to acknowledge that the perspective here is shaped by things that I've learned from a lot of people, including uh, Noga, Frank, uh, Terry Regeer and, and others as well. So the big question that motivates uh, this part of the masterclass is how do people organize experience into named categories?